But the overlay was made by <laughs> one of my editors named Hey Bud Edits. Oh, that looks really nice. Yeah, it looks nice. Let's clean it up a bit. And it'll be perfect for like sponsors and stuff, because we can we can drop a sponsor on the uh, right or left of us. Cheers, man. Yeah. Can't wait to get all that money. <laughs> I wasn't even talking about money. I was talking about <laughs> format. I'm talking about money. Okay. All right. Well, Lawrence is talking about money. So. Can't wait. Can't wait to be rich. The, uh, the I can change the taskbar, but I'm not going to. And uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Bruce. I don't want to interrupt this, uh, <laughs> but I do because I just noticed your Nightbot has a command for Kraken cheated at Animal Crossing. I didn't make that. Okay. Okay. My, this is your channel. One of my mods. You just one of my mods. Say, oh, I. Uh, uh, my, someone else made that. On my channel. <laughs> it's your channel. Okay. Take some responsibility. One of my mods made it. Okay. And he did. And why? It is a fact that Kraken did cheat. How did I cheat? You time traveled, my friend. On the first day, I went one day ahead to see what the day was going to be. That is cheating. Because it launched. That is cheating. Okay. Is that not cheating? <sighs> That's cheating. I hope. Okay. Lawrence? You know what? It's absolutely it's cheating. I'm not taking cheating. I'm not taking freaking handouts for my viewers all the time. I'm not getting uh, KK Ska sent to me <laughs> as soon as I launch the game. You know, before because, we were before this podcast, let, let me let you know how what just happened. I, before this podcast, we had a nice, fun conversation about how Crack was like, "Hey, have you seen KK Ska?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, my viewers sent it to me immediately." And then he used it against me in the podcast before we were having a nice conversation. The Kraken uses it against me. <laughs> I, I've learned from Lawrence. He, well, you may not know, and we discussed before the podcast started. Right. Lawrence reads Sun Tzu's Art of War every time before he leaves the house. <laughs> I read it now. I'm going to take his advice. I'm going to read it before I even open up a Discord call with my friends. You wonder why I'm late? I am finishing the last chapter of Sun Tzu's Art of War, and I'm preparing strategy. to use all information yeah. that you offer to me back at you. It's retribution, okay? Wow. This is... This was a podcast, now it's war. <laughs> Jeez, I had no idea. Lawrence, is this I'm one cracking? Get, I don't... Like catchy one liners we can put in the trailer for like, you know, this is a real <laughs> Are we making, we're making a trailer for this podcast? I didn't know that. I yeah. mean, if you want more advertisers, you gotta you gotta, yeah, we gotta give gotta them get something. Those sponsors. Yeah. That's true. You gotta get that sizzle reel, Bruce. I uh just today we had a hum Damn. I know Ooh. I'm watching this bee get torn apart. Yeah, that bee's getting fucked. Oh no, the bees oh, no, are messing getting... up the wasp. The wasp, it's yeah. the wasp. Um Today we had I a, saw a wasp today. It was scary. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. Because I was just about to talk about something that happened to me today too. Um, were you talking about? Did you see a wasp in the Animal Crossing, Lawrence, or was it in real life? <laughs> no, it was a real life wasp. Believe it or not. Oh, they still exist. Wow. And actually, nature is uh, more than ever. It's outside in Los Angeles. It's awesome. I see. <laughs> I walked into like seven thousand spider webs when I was taking a walk on Monday night. Spiders are out there. You know that spiders fly on. Uh, the electrical currents of the earth. Do you know that? That's a real thing. No. That's a real thing. They Well, why can't Spider Man do that? Uh well because scientists just discovered it recently. Well, why can't Spider Man do I it? I mean he probably because spiders could always do it, then Spider Man should be able to do he it. He probably can if now that scientists know that this is what spiders do. But how do they fly on electricity? I don't know, man. They're they're cool. Okay? They're awesome. I don't know why they do that or how, but they do it. You know what? Don't doesn't do that. Fucking wasps. So wasps. Get rid of them. That's true. Wasps. They, yeah, they fly on wings. Yeah, <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> Everything flies on wings. That's not. That's not special at all. Hey, by the way, welcome to talk to the internet number twenty six. I always forget twenty six, twenty seven. It's just right. What is it? Uh, let me check my folders. Let me check my editing folders. This is how I remember. I totally. I always forget. Always forget. We are on twenty six. Twenty six. Okay. Welcome to talk to the internet number twenty six. We're, Which means we've done this for a full half year at this point. Is that true? It is. It is 100% true. We've been doing it for six months. Because 52, oh 52 weeks is a year. Look at. Do we have anything special to celebrate that fact? No, we just realized it right now. I mean, I, I, got, I got something. Oh, wait. Oh, there. Lawrence has something special. Yeah, I, I, uh, I found a cool video. Oh, okay. Well, you <laughs> 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 did all the time anyway. So. Ooh. Um, okay, let me think of... Okay, so this video is is bare... Mm, it's kind of safe for work. Kind of. I guess I should... Should I drop this into the Discord, I guess? Uh, sure, yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll work. All right. I don't... Oh, Bruce, boy. We just had this brand new brand new overlay. It's gonna, it's gonna break it. It all it's up. gonna break it, but that's all right. We gotta, we gotta find a way to get this out in front of the, in front of the internet, so... If you just open it in a new tab, uh, it shouldn't... 
mess things too bad. Whoa. Oh. Oh no. Oh, you don't know. Because then you can, like, you know, pop it back. Can I, see, I, uh, can I, see the chat? I scoured the internet and found the best video I could. Also, the most, uh, most futurist video I could. <laughs> Wait a minute. What? <laughs> no. What are you doing? He's in VR. No. He's in VR. Oh, oh. oh no. That's not right. That These are jokes. This, is re this isn't real. This is real. This is not Spin real. A little bit. What are you talking about? No, <laughs> no way. This is totally not real. Why is this our half year anniversary video? Lawrence? Well, no one else did anything, <laughs> so I don't want to. I don't want to hear complaints. Where's Where's your celebration, Kraken? You're right. I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it again. There. <laughs> Hear it. I'm gonna make sure I want to should, see your reaction. Have music or something. We should have. I'm gonna take I this as an opportunity to get the coffee that just arrived. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> you will remember me. <laughs> Don't let your life pass you by. This can't. Oh, for audio listeners, I feel like we should. Oh yeah, describe it, Lawrence. Let you guys describe what you're seeing. Oh sure. So this is this is the future, the future of tech and the future of intimacy. Um, there are two gentlemen wearing sweatpants and uh, <laughs> uh, they. Uh, to describe their physique, I would say probably like powerful dad. Is, is uh, yeah, that's say. a good way to describe it. Yeah. Um, one is on his knees in a uh, what looks like a convention hall because it's just bare concrete floor, wearing a, uh, a VR headset, and he is performing what looks like the most enthusiastic of fellatio on air. There's just no one there. Nobody there. Um, yeah, he's uh, he's corkscrewing. He's he's working. He's working the gonads. He's working the balls. Yeah, he's doing really good. Yeah. He even he even spits a little bit on it to to, to grease it up a little bit, um, and then a uh, compatriot a compatriot of his is uh, also wearing a headset, standing but uh, humping the air sensually, very sensually. Um, again, what uh, what really puts the the frosting on the cake is that they're both wearing uh, sweatpants with the drawstrings <laughs> untied, and they're wearing like a headset, a VR headset that no one's ever seen before. And it says like VR box on it or something. Like it's like a completely, totally generic VR headset. Why are they doing this on a convention floor, Lawrence? Is it a, was it a, was it a porn convention? They're demonstrating. Uh, I don't know actually. I don't know anything about the context of that video. I just know that it's beautiful. Okay. Virtual. Let's see here. Okay. I guess it's just a cheap, a cheap VR helmet. Uh, it has like a little little controller. It certainly didn't look cheap the way they were using it. Yeah, like, they were they were finding some value. It <laughs> looked like it was real life <laughs> 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 that they were doing. <laughs> uh, but I guess my actual my actual celebratory event uh, is posing the most complicated and nuanced of questions to you guys. We're going to have an excellent discussion around a topic that affects us all deeply. Mm -hmm. um, and we've all been here. That's the glory of this this soon to be discussion. In fact, I'm going to put a pin in it. Um, this is probably going to win a podcast award of some sort. Um, Do they have but, podcast uh, awards? Uh, yeah, they're potties or something. I don't know. <laughs> we'll get one for this. I'm potties. Sure. <laughs> That's a great... No, I'm, I'm copywriting that. It's our, I'm going to win a potty. It's already taken. Sorry, Kraken. Really? Yeah, man. It's the word oh. potty. Like, you're going potty. You get it? That's why I recognize <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. All right. All right, Lawrence. It is with the question. Right. Okay. Uh, we've all we've all been here. You uh, you're at a restaurant. You're having a nice meal, but the meal is is let's not say it's completely dry or it's not uniform. There's there's fluid involved, uh, and maybe you're eating out of a bowl or of something. And you're eating with a fork, and the fork has an interesting weight distribution such that question. Yes. Correct. <laughs> Why would you be eating with a fork if it's wet? Wouldn't that um, be a spoon job? Um, it's not. A, it's not quite a soup. Uh, but you know what? Let's say spoons as well. Spo Any utensil. Spoon job is what that guy was doing in the VR headset. Anyways, go right ahead. <laughs> Question: Why yes, am I correct. using both a spoon and a fork? Uh, you don't pasta? necessarily have to be using both at the same time. Uh, you could be using either. This is this is a generic utensil that's in your hand. I just I tried to can be. Can be a spork. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. That's. I okay. would like it not to be a spork. I don't like. Okay, sporks. it doesn't have to be. Uh, <laughs> let's let's just say it is some sort of tool. Used to bring food to your mouth that has a handle of some sort that you touch okay. with your hand. That's that's kind of the vital part of it here. Um, so are are you there? Do you do you have the? I'm following. Yeah. I'm not really. I'm not. Have you asked the question yet or no? 
No, no, no. Okay, no. Still, right. still warming up here. The, pre- the preface. Got it. Yeah, we're, 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 we're coasting down the runway right now. Okay. We're about to take off. All right, here we go. So you uh, you go for a drink or something. You, you put your fork down, your spoon, spork, knife, uh, what, what have you. Uh, and it slides into the food that you're eating such that part of the food, whether it's the sauce or the oils or what have you, gets all over the handle. It's just, it's swimming in your, in your food now. So it's on the handle of the utensil you're using. That's correct. Okay. What do you do? What do you do? How do you, how do you address this situation? I feel like there are some common a good question. techniques. One is to pull the utensil out and then just suck off the handle. That's right. Just use your mouth to clean it that's off. A, that's what those guys are doing in the VR headset. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's exactly uh-huh. what they're doing. Yes. Uh, another is to uh, use your napkin or, or your, your cloth uh, napkin of some sort to, uh, to clean it off. Um, but, you know, that's messy because you're still going to have to, you know, touch it at some point. Uh, or do you just, do you ask for another utensil? Um, these, are, these are difficult questions and I pose them to you now. Well, Kraken, why don't you go ahead? I think it depends on the day and the mood. <laughs> so <laughs> on a good day, a good mood. I would wipe it off with my napkin and continue eating, noting it to be a simple but understandable mistake. On a bad day, if I'm feeling down or if I, if I really goofed it, like it's really just kind of slobbered in that sauce, then I will continue eating with that utensil, despite how messy it is, just wow. to punish myself p- for <laughs> what? having dropped it yes because that this is a this is, it's negative reinforcement that i will never drop it again it is punishing myself for being clumsy and <laughs> reiterating this is not okay with the negative behavior what happens if you drop it again then it's the same the, really cy- the cycle repeats you do it again <laughs> well, I, I feel like i feel like if you drop it again there's there's really no harm because it's just what yeah. it's getting more food on the handle that already had food on it that, well, I'm sorry. Uh, drop it again on a different day. <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't sure if your negative reinforcement, your punishment, carries over oh, to later well, days. I mean, you then wash it afterwards. Like, I'm, I'm confused. Are you saying that <laughs> I now I maintain this as the dirty spoon, and I only use that on bad no, days? No, 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 no. So, like, think of it this way. So each meal is its own clean slate, right? So you start you yes. start the meal with a clean utensil, and you drop it in the bowl, and you punish yourself by eating with the dirty utensil for the rest of the meal, right? What happens in the next meal? Because you said the punishment is to make sure you never do it again. <laughs> well, what happens in the, in the next meal if you mm. accidentally drop it in the meal I again? See. What do you do? You're saying we need to set up like rising stakes yes. where it just gets, it gets worse and worse. Worse and worse. So like the next punishment is what? what? What's your next punishment if you drop it in the second time? Oh, boy. Um, I've never gotten that far. I've, I've, I, don't th- I don't think I've ever made that mistake twice. Um, That's just a testament to your technique, Craig. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I think if it were to happen again, yeah. I would either throw this, the fork out that makes and sense. then eat the rest of the meal with my hands. That's, that's a good punishment. As we regress into our... You know, now, Neanderthal ways. I know you're perfect, Craig, and so you wouldn't do it a third time, but what happened if you did it a third time? What happened if you did I throw the meal out? You throw, I throw oh, the meal out. Oh, no. Yeah, I go hungry. You know what? I think you've uh, effectively leveled it up so that at that point, if you threw out your meal, you'd never do it again. I don't think you would ever yeah. do it again. That makes sense. You don't want to know what happens if I do. <laughs> Wait, what happens on the fourth time? You sew your own mouth shut? I can't share that information. <laughs> that would be TOS. Cut his hand off. Um, um, brief aside, sorry, Bruce. Oh, no. I, I'm extremely fascinated to hear what you have to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just small observation. We're watching a video of somebody making uh, like a Vietnamese omelet oh, crepe thing. Uh, here, hold on. I'll bring it back up. It was awesome. Yeah, it was. It was incredibly awesome. I just wanna. I just wanna posit that perhaps the coolest you will ever feel is when you crack open an egg with one hand. I've never done it before. I've tried. I've tr- it's messy until you get the technique down. I've tried and failed, but it is so. It's so cracking. Can you do that? No. Just bang. <laughs> I like I like him opening the little, the little trap door for the for the egg to go in. That makes me happy. This is a uh, all right, Bruce. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, I saw. Nah. So, I keep I keep I keep distracting. I'm sorry. So my answer, I don't know if you guys know. I, th- I probably I may have talked about this at some point in front of you guys. Um, as a as a child, as a baby, I was uh, I don't like we're talking six months old, 
when I first learned how to eat. I would not eat with my fingers. I refused. Um, because I hated getting my fingers sticky or dirty or anything like yep. that. Even early on as a child, most, most children, most babies, I assume, like you guys, are dirty, messy, disgusting babies that stink and smell and are... Actually, I was a lot like you, Bruce. <laughs> I don't know if you believe that. Now, frankly, I find it hard to believe that you were a clean boy. How dare uh, you? How dare you? But I'm just saying, you know, looks can be deceiving. I was also a uh, a no stick. I was I, uh, no stick. I hated a, I hated to be dirty as a baby. So, um, so now, if this does happen, because it does happen occasionally, I'm like Kraken though, where I'm very vigilant about making sure to not drop my utensil. Mm -hmm. into the meal and in most cases I'll even pull it out and put it on a napkin to make sure it doesn't fall into the bowl um, because I don't want it to happen but if it does because it does uh, the first thing I do is I, I stare at it with disgust <laughs> I usually do I, I I literally examine I pull it out and ex <laughs> I examine it I examine it and look for stains because I hate it it makes me so upset and uh, if I find a stain then I, I generally, well, not even, not even in COVID times right now, I don't want to lick my fingers and like, you know, like use my saliva to clean it off. So then I'll have to dip my napkin in water and pull the napkin out and use it to clean the utensil, the front and back of the utensil. Often, even then, after I've cleaned it, I can still feel my saliva and the food on my utensil. And I have to get an entirely new fork. I have to get an entirely new fork. Sometimes if it's plastic, I feel bad because I have to throw it away. And I don't want to throw away a plastic utensil because that's bad for the environment. So I will wash that plastic utensil and put the plastic utensil back into my silverware drawer so that I can use it again. Wait, what? You save the plastic <laughs> utensil? Only, only in this case. Um, wow. Wow. But so, but no, but then uh, okay, I have a fundamental issue. With please, this because later on, after this meal is finished, uh -huh. you will find the off, like the the off brand plastic utensil amidst your good silverware. That's correct. Yes, and you will remember that this is here because it fell in and it got stained. But I washed it, and it it, it became messy. But I washed it. Yeah, but like, it it is already born of failure, and otherwise <laughs> it would be in the trash. But now you have kept it because it has failed you. This is I, this flies in the face of my my approach, well, and I have issues. Kraken, much like I like to live my life, I like to give everything a second chance. Everything deserves a second chance. And if this plastic fork fell into my, if I if it didn't serve me right the first time, you know what? I give it one more try. I give it one more try. Now, if I don't, if it falls in again, on the second try. Imagine it's too small or whatever. It's angled weird. I then, I, th I pick it up and throw it away in disgust. I, th I put it into the trash bin with a frown on my face. And I mm -hmm. wash my hands, come back to my meal. And I hate every bite. <laughs> <laughs> the meal is sullied. It's ruined. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> Fool me twice. All right. So, but what if, what if when you're using your utensil, like a piece of it breaks off, you know, it, like a oh, plastic. That, that happens all the time to me. Yeah, that happens. That happens often. Yeah. If do you save that? Is that no, considered a wounded soldier? No. And you put that in your little drawer, and you're like, I, I'm going to come back to this and see if that works out later. No, Lawrence has seen me actually. We used to eat at this place called Benny's when we worked at the uh, Funhouse, and I, they would give me this fork that never worked. And also, I would always try to cut chicken with the fork, and so I would press down with my fork onto the chicken, and it would always snap. Like every, I mean, like we're talking eighty percent of the time. I would do it, I'd just snap right in half as I was trying to eat my food, and I have to go get a new fork. Now, in that case, I get really mad because it got my fingers dirty. Uh, it ruined a plastic utensil, which is bad for the earth, and then I have to go get another plastic utensil. So then, in that case, what I would do, Lawrence would see this, is I would put all of my food in a bag, and I'd strap the bag to my head and eat like a horse. <laughs> And for the rest of the day, no one could get a word out of you because there would just be a bag on your yeah, face. because it's my feed bag. <laughs> it kind of, uh, it doubled as a feed bag and then also a, a sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, a shame tent of sort. Shame uh, tent. Yes, that's right. I love yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So we all knew that when Bruce was wearing the bag, it's not a good time to approach him with mm -hmm. uh, 
with you know small right. small issues yes. like mm-hmm. the channels down or we're out of money. <laughs> channels uh, down. Yeah, it was it was. I mean, to be frank, uh, it, it may have been a bit awkward at the time, but only now in my experience can I look back and realize what a gift it was for you to telegraph your emotional state like that. Well, you knew you knew not to approach me at that point. Yeah, for sure. Don't don't we all wear a metaphysical shame tent in some times? You know. <laughs> It's just his was a bit more literal. <laughs> I guess you're right. I didn't think about that. That's an interesting question to circulate. Uh, what are what are tells that you're not feeling your hundred percentist? I I have like a series of shirts that are kind of billowy and thick fabriced. So if I like if I drank a lot, then my body would like retain water and puff up real bad, and then I just feel extra like doughy and smushy. And that's when I'd break out one of the shame shirts because it kind of <laughs> obscures my lumps a little more. Um, so I knew, I, I don't know that I ever told anyone that like, hey, when you see me in this shirt, it's because I feel frumpy as hell. Huh. Uh, but that's, that's I did, I did have like one or two shirts that were like, they were in the back of the closet, but they were my, um, I'm retaining water like a pregnant woman shirt. Mm. That's a good tell. What about you, what, what about you Kraken? <laughs> I usually scowl at everyone. But, that's my but you self. already do that. I do? <laughs> Your face. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I've never seen you. I don't think I've ever seen you scowl at anybody ever. I, uh, let's see. What is my tell? I, 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 I don't know. I, I think I'm just like a lot more curt. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't like do my, I don't really wear a, a no bullshit, you know, shirt like <laughs> though i like that i like some sort I like, of visual i like that too that, yeah yeah some sort of visual shame tent but it's more like a, a shame miasma that i think follows me into the room and either with my like my footsteps or my pace or my, the way i approach everyone's like oh boy he's in his shame place no one <laughs> no one uh no one no one tell him the channel is down it's like I, it's, I just, it's like when you're uh, the murderer and gmod and you have that black smoke around you <laughs> That mm, that's yeah. that's what it reminds me of is the that's the shame miasma. Uh, yeah, I think for me I'm I'm like a lot like Kraken where I'll uh, I generally won't talk as much. So like if you see me and I'm having like a bum, just a bummer day, like I was having a real bad day in the morning yesterday because I I got a flat tire and then I had to like mm. uh, take it to a repair shop and I had to I had to reinflate my tire four times in a five mile drive to get this car to the oh. to the it was it was a rough morning. But um, when I woke up normally, like I'm super like lovey dovey and happy, and I say hi to Autumn and like give her a hug and all this other stuff, and I like I could, the only thing I could manage was a hug and a kiss, and I was like bye, and I left because I knew it was gonna be <laughs> a bummer of a drive, oh, no. and I was super bummed out. But that's usually usually I'll just be less less happy or uh, like you said, Kurt. I don't say I don't say very many words. I'm just like I just gotta get my shit done and move on. Yeah, and I, I, I had to. Oh, go ahead, correct me. I, I think it's very much like on to the next thing, on to the next thing. Like, I get very like tunnel vision and don't really have time to like stop and be present. And usually, people around me are like, "Okay, he's in like work mode," yep. or like he's in you know yep. focus mode. Yep. What are you gonna say, Lawrence? Oh, I uh, I had actually a bizarrely similar experience yesterday. Um, it had been a while since I'd taken the bike out, and I needed to return a battery to Amazon because it did not fit the drill that I bought it for. Um, yeah, there's well, uh, it's unf- an unfolding narrative. Uh, it, it's really just a series of whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so it, it had been a minute. So I charged it up and the tires were low. So I took them to a gas station. The first gas station, the credit card thingy was broken on the, the air machine, which, you know, it happens. Uh, although I'm very lucky to have a gas station around my block that has an air machine with a credit card reader on it. It's very nice. Um, so I went to the other gas station, uh, did the thing where I go in, ask for quarters. They're like, oh, I'll just turn it on. I'm like, oh, thank you. That's a weird dance you have to do. I don't know why they just don't like have a button on that that you can hit to turn it on. Um, anyway, so I went out, filled up my tires. The little like air pressure gauge on the thing was broken, so I had to use the one that I keep in my bike. So I air it up, check it, air it up, check it. Uh, that went smoothly enough, but then I went to screw the cap back on my uh, rear tire, and somehow the little knobby thing that airs up the tire had like smushed a lot of the threads around the uh whatever it's called the stem oh yeah so the cap wouldn't go back on oh Jeez. no Jeez. 
Jeez. That's, that's part so of that's part of the of... aesthetic look of your bike. Yeah, no, I, I forced it back on there. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> uh, it's like it's soft metal, so if I can get the cat back on, it's probably going to rethread. But uh, lame. Um, sorry, some people are saying that my audio is low. Uh, I could, uh, I could, yeah, I guess if I bump it now, it's not a problem. I, I'm just so everybody's aware. I have, I have been bumped all the way up to uh, 200 percent Discord. So. Yeah, it's it's weird because I feel like this is the same volume level it was yesterday, last week. Whatever. One second. Um, We're just gonna watch this video of. Uh, all right. How's that? Paul's drag race. That's, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, whatever. I got that back on. Drove all the way to the. There's an Amazon shop. Like they actually have a store that I had to return it to. Uh, dropped my stuff off, and then like. An interesting series of events happened. There was like a couple trying to return like a whole table or something. It was this giant box that was in a... It, it, like the box was disintegrating as they were carrying it in. Because they were just like grabbing it and like yanking on it and parts were coming off. And they were dragging it along the sidewalk and it was just <laughs> shredding into pieces as they were going. And then they like tried to get it through the door and it wouldn't fit. Um, and like I had to help them out to like get it inside. And then this old, this like elderly lady comes up and she's like, I need help too. I was like, oh, okay. So I had to like take some boxes out of the back of her car into the thing. It's just, I, I, I'm amazed sometimes at how people can just kind of throw themselves to the wind and figure it out as they go. Uh, I guess, I guess I would never like go to a place and have no idea how I'm going to get something inside. <laughs> I, I guess you could just ask the people mm. working there, like, hey, I need a hand, but, uh... Yeah, that was weird. Also, I forgot my mask, so I just had to keep wearing my motorcycle helmet, because you weren't allowed inside without a mask. Right, that, that makes That's sense. That's hilarious. <laughs> You're like a GTA character. Basically. <laughs> walk into a building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, it was exactly like that. I couldn't take my helmet off, so... <laughs> That's so funny. But uh, I, 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 have a, I have a related question, Lawrence. Uh, this kind of occurred to me while you're telling that story, and I I don't know if this is considered rude or uh, just kind of accurate or just a non sequitur, but I feel like you were the kind of kid that would put a like a playing card in the spokes of their their bicycle when you rode around your little town. So it would go like oh, like little playing cards. Yeah, is that true? that's nice. I'm trying to remember. I don't think I ever did that because my bike was so cheap and shitty. Uh, like my parents bought me straight up like a $50 bike from Walmart and the chain kept popping off when I would r ride. So it would like, I would be trying to go uphill. So I'd be, I'd be gassing it a little bit and the chain would like poing and then lock itself into the gears, which would also make the bike screech to a halt immediately. Oh, so it's dangerous. Yeah. And then I would, yeah, it, yeah, I fell off that multiple times, and then I would have to, like, get off to the side of the road and then yank it out and then try and, like, chain it up again. Um, so the bike was already very difficult to just bike like a normal bike. Uh, so I think most of the time, and, and at some point, actually, I, I, like, kicked it, and then I just, like, threw it into the ditch and then walked home because um, oh I was so mad. <laughs> um, so you just abandoned it in a ditch? <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I no wait no no no, it's coming back to me. I did throw it into a ditch because it felt good to throw it, but then I picked it up and carried uh, it home. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, you got to do that sometimes. That's even better. You got to do that sometimes. Uh, but but when I carried it home, I just then I just threw it into the garage and never touched it again. Uh, uh, oh. So I was okay. so busy nice hating that bike to to try and dress it up in any way. I just love the idea of like. <laughs> Throwing your bike in a ditch and be like, "Oh man, now how am I gonna get home?" I've, <laughs> like, I've never done that. I've done, going into the ditch. And I, it up. I've done that before. Haven't you guys ever done that? Where you're like angry enough to like throw something, or no, do something, and then you go, and you're like, "Ah oh, shit, I gotta go fucking." Get I usually that thing. think things through pretty. Carefully. Oh, give me a no, fucking yeah. break. <laughs> Crankin' <laughs> <laughs> Crankin' never got mad at video games when he was a child. Nope, I was very level headed. I. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think right. I ever threw a controller. <laughs> Here's a, this is a, what do you mean? Yeah, right. This is where we cut to the montage of all of the points of Kraken screaming at a video game on his stream. Nope. Oh, okay. Well, there's my adult life, which yes, I make a living screaming at video games on stream. Mm -hmm. As a child, though, 
extremely mild mannered and <laughs> incredibly cool. I, I think that the term is uh, cool as a pickle, and I would <laughs> I would not do anything to invoke uh, attention or wrath um, from either those in the online lobby with me or uh, my my family or friends. Um, although I did start my YouTube career griefing people in Left 4 Dead, so I guess that would be <laughs> the pivotal point. As soon as I started making content online is when I became a real shitter. So I, <laughs> before then, though, I was a great kid. I don't, I, I, I don't believe that. Yeah, allow me, to, allow me to posit a theory, and this may be a little like Boomer Greatest Generation flavored, but <laughs> I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Mm -hmm. Kryken, what is the hardest, most rage-inducing game you can remember playing as a child? Hmm. I immediately came up with oh, an answer. Oh, boy. I came up with, I'll crack it if you want me to, I can answer first, because I came up with an answer yeah, right you away. You go first, you go first. For my, uh, my, it's Mario Kart. Any, anytime I played Mario Kart with friends, mm -hmm. it was a not, like a, just a nightmare. Like, it was like, we had, we had the most fun, it was the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. You'd have the most fun beating your friends, but then also if you got beat, oh my gosh, what a, just a, the screaming and the insults, and the, mainly coming from me, and just oh, it's just a terrible time that I think I've told again I've told this story before, but that we had a, a double dash LAN party where we connected two game cubes uh, in some in some kid's house, and we had uh, four people, or was it was it four or eight? I guess it would be it was eight to a team or four to a team for like for double dash because I think you could pl play up to up to eight people on in double dash, so you'd have four in one room and four in another room, and uh, the cops came and shut it down. At like one in the morning. What? Yeah, they did because we were playing in the garage, and they're like, oh, they open yeah. they opened up the garage and they're like, where are the drugs? <laughs> and I, it was a com <laughs> totally sober. It was just all children. It was all it, it was all <laughs> a bunch of like eighteen year olds who had never touched weed or alcohol, nothing, none of it. That's hilarious. and and we were like, uh, there's Pepsi over there, and <laughs> that was it. And they shut it down because we were having too much fun in Mario Kart. <sighs> Man, I. I'm thinking about my answer. I'm sure there's better ones. There, there was like a whole, you, you know, I, I, I loved rediscovering this, but basically there's an age where all you do is play these games and therefore you're able to commit yourself to such a deep understanding of that game that like we can never begin to reach at this age. You know, like even in our variety, like live streaming life, we play so many different games that like I, I could do stuff in Donkey Kong 64 that I'm just positive I cannot do today <laughs> because even though I was like six, that's all I played and I just got so good at it. So I think it was either Donkey Kong 64 or Bomberman were kind of the two games that I, I remember having very deep frustration moments at. Uh, specifically, I think in Bomberman, there were some later levels. Like it, Basically, any game, if you get to the very end, it's like you can tell when they start running out of money and the designers and the level designers kind of just start making it up as they go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and those levels are are the BS ones. Oh, my God, that pelican. I know, he just ate an entire pigeon. <laughs> Holy crap. He's hungry, man. Pelicans are terrifying. Like you can see the bird fighting as it's going down his throat. Wow. Oh. That's it. That's it. Go ahead. Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Craig. I don't just even know what I, of feathers. what I would finish my thought with. It's, I just, it's uh, those those old games, when they ran out of money, usually the design just got to like, I don't know, make it harder. Just throw in all the mechanics, <laughs> yeah. make the time limit shorter. Like, it's just harder. That's why it's the last level is harder. And that stuff really uh, ruined me as a, as a child because I would still want to beat the game. And I think I did almost all the time. It's just that, ugh, they were... I don't think I ever beat Donkey Kong 64, actually. I think that game has still eluded me. Really? Because you have to get every single golden banana. And some of them were just untenably difficult. They were like the challenge barrel ones. They were just ridiculous. Oh, you should beat it on stream. I, I should. I really should. That was my first game, really, ever. I, it was my first game I got for the N64. So I, it would be nice to return to. Lawrence, was there anything like that that uh, would bring out the competitive nature of Lawrence? Oh, it's not a... Like, I... Uh, yeah, I would get pretty salty in competitive games, I guess. But mostly, I just never really had anyone to play with. So oh, okay, yeah. Most of my early gamer rage was just focused at playing, like, ludicrously unbalanced games for the original NES. Which, 
was some was a theory I was going to throw out that potentially, Kraken, if you had never suffered ad, uh, adolescent or pre-adolescent rage at a video game, it may just be because the games you were playing were a lot more fair. No. You don't think so? No. I, I've i gone back and played some of the games I played as a kid on stream, and like, yeah, no, they, they cut a lot of corners. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But all right. There, there may be some. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're maybe referencing some. Like, I definitely stayed away from a few genres of games that I think would fall under that category. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I do recall more than once I would get the very logical uh, argument from my parents that if they make you so angry, why are you playing? Yeah. Uh, mm. And just kind of like fuming. You don't get it, mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know that I ever threw a controller, but I certainly like would torque it in my hands to where you could hear like the plastic crackling and popping. Um, really? Yeah. Oh yeah. You I guys mean, those are both angry kids. I had never once threw a controller. Not once. Wow, that's good. That's really good. I think Lawrence is. It's like, what would it help? I think Lawrence is. You, you I think Lawrence is. Lawrence is right. Your games were easier. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should I, I mean, throw it on a challenge? I want to see you guys beat the games I beat as a kid on your streams, okay? And see if you don't throw your controllers. <laughs> okay. Give me a list. Oh, this is actually this is actually an interesting. What do, what do you got? What do you got? All right. I'm gonna put together a list. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to. I'd like to have the opportunity to thoroughly uh, embarrass Kraken in front of the entire internet <laughs> by just mm. just rinsing all of the games he thought were hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. this, this is this is the this is what I was saying, man. Art of War. Uh, Art of War. All I do is antagonize my friends uh, instead of uh, uh, letting of them war. like. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that has nothing to do with Art of War, actually. Uh, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> antagonizing your friends. <laughs> yeah. I think Sun Tzu was probably a good friend, right? Hopefully. Yeah. Seeking out meaning meaningless conflict is a pretty much the exact opposite of anything he would have espoused in that book. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's that's where I'm at. But but I mean, going back to Bruce, what you were talking about. I mean, obviously, logically, throwing things doesn't help. Oh, no, not at all. But I've been no. in multiple, yeah, but I've been in multiple situations where you just, you just got the fire and you got to let it out somehow. Um, God, one of the, so nowadays, now that I'm older and wiser, if I'm ever super frustrated and I want to throw something, I can at least intercept myself and find a way to get that out in a in a, I don't want to say safe, but in a non-destructive way. So I'll just like throw a pillow or something like that. Oh, that's good. And that feels good. Yeah. yeah. Or if I'm going to throw something, I'll find something to throw it at. Or uh, I think I... God, what was it? There was a PlayStation controller that I really hated. Like just hated the hell out of it because the battery kept dying and it wouldn't charge. And like a button would stick or whatever. So I went out into the driveway and just threw it into the ground as hard as I could. Because uh, that felt good. Um, but there was one time... The car alarm going off. Great. <laughs> uh, there was one time where I was a teen. I was a, a roiling teen in the throes of romance. Ooh. Um, yeah. And and there were there were mutual feelings expressed, except the the lady in question was dating somebody else, and it was kind of up in the air for a little bit. Is she gonna you know who's she gonna choose? Uh, eventually, she was like, Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with my boyfriend. And I was like, Okay, I respect that or whatever. And then uh, she left, and that's when I let that's when I let my my good God your boner rage still going. your boner rage yeah my my I, it was very intense boner rage oh my I, God <laughs> excellent read up um, I had intense boner rage going because I thought I was gonna get to see a boob uh, <laughs> and so she left I managed to keep it together until then and then um, I everything everything kind of exploded and I threw the only thing in my hands which were my car keys. I just whoosh threw them as hard as I possibly could. We're talking like Man of Ste or like Superman Returns. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's really nice. Uh, Superman Returns baseball style. Just and I was in like, I was in the parking lot next to a big empty field because it was Texas and Texas is nothing but big empty fields. So I just 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 cannonballed those keys into the empty field as hard as I could <laughs> and screamed a little bit Wait, and then just kind of keys. Yes, they were my car keys that I needed oh, to start yeah, my car. Oh, for sure you oh. lost them. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I I threw them, and I stood there for later. a second, letting the boner rage seep out. And then I was like, oh, oh, no, I need those. And then I just stood there for a second thinking about it, like, okay, what do I do now? How? What? Hmm. 
And I just sort of resign myself to there being only one thing to do. What's that beeping? There's a fucking car alarm. There's a car alarm, yeah. Oh, they got it. Okay. Oh, somebody got it. All right. Uh, and then, yeah, I just I just was like, well, there's only one thing to do now. Uh, and I just started combing the field. I would just, like, go, like, back and <laughs> forth, row after row, kind of, like, walking the field in the slight direction of, of where I threw them. And eventually, shockingly, I had a, I had a flashlight in my car, too, because that... It was, I was night. Oh, it was nighttime when you yeah. did it? Oh my oh, yeah. gosh. Uh, well, it was buddy. it was actually okay because uh, uh maybe I'm being uh, overly constructive, but the I think it took about two and a half hours. Well, I was going to say, but of just and, walking. And, uh, you, you were able to walk off your rage though, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. I spent that time in the in the muggy hot Texas summer Texas night uh with a <laughs> With a flashlight with very dying batteries, trying to find my uh, my keys, um, and yeah, I had that all, all that time to kind of think and and sort of mellow out a little bit, and to just kind of ruminate on the fact that you know I put myself into that position, and this kind of like Kraken, where you were talking about how you have to sort of uh, flagellate yourself when you make small mistakes. Uh, that was essentially my my penance was uh, was picking back and forth across this giant empty field with lots of dead grass to try to find my keys <laughs> yeah uh nutbuster 69,000 appropriately uh why not just jack off i did plenty of that believe me. Um, <laughs> over the two hours in the field <laughs> <laughs> no just in the uh in the months and months of uh of um of hoping that i would get to see a boob uh it was very exciting times and also very very arousing times and it did require a lot of masturbation to get through the day uh, with uh, with a clear head at any time. The older the older I get, the more I realize how how nice it is. If you're upset about something, or if you're just you're just feeling down, is to take a walk. Taking a walk like really helps, man. It is it is such a nice mm. thing to do. Go outside and just like just think about things for a little bit. It's just a good way to like get your brain going, get your get your body going. I don't know. I just real quick circling back to the video game challenge because I looked it up oh. I remember now Super Monkey Ball 2 okay That's Monkey Ball down Monkey Ball is rough but I will say Monkey Ball has save files Ooh. so Im yeah. imagine Monkey Ball without saving you have to play the whole game and if you lose you start over because that's you that's wouldn't NES stuff. beat the game the game is not built for that <laughs> if you if you genuinely want to play Monkey Ball and <laughs> never fall off a stage yeah, good luck, man. Lawrence's, right. Lawrence's face. <laughs> is like, that is that what you're accepting the challenge? You're, are you, you're making my point for you, me. No, are I, you one-upping my challenge by saying <laughs> I will do it and also not fall off? I'm no, no. Well, sort of. I, I'm saying that a a not entirely accurate but somewhat appropriate simulation of trying to play an NES game, especially when you're like six and don't have the motor control or even the mental faculties to really understand tenets of game design and things like that. Imagine that soft brain trying to play Super Monkey Ball without save files. Is that's that what kind. You did? I would say that's a loose approximation of the uh, the gauntlet that I went through as a young gamer. Mm. Yes, uh, and it made me the man I am today. <laughs> so, Kraken, if you want to aspire to this this gaming greatness, <laughs> there is but one thing you must do. It is, uh, I, and it is beat Super Monkey Ball without saving. I appreciate the. Uh... The hand you've extended me, and I think I'm good. Oh, but um, we'll turn it down. Okay, all right. That was, that was fast. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I look. I do permadeath in Skyrim. If maybe that's the exact same experience, you know. Uh, I could see that because Skyrim. Uh, I have. I okay. I'll I'll I'll, I'll roll with this. I uh, I did. I modded Skyrim to the point I had like a realistic uh, reshade or something on like mm -hmm. that. To the point where like when it was night, you actually couldn't see anything unless you had a torch or some light yep. source. And uh, Skyrim being what it is, I kind of forgot to save for like two hours. And I was climbing up this tower or whatever and I had a torch. And I was just like walking along this path and then the path just stopped. But it was so sudden that I just kind of careened right off oh, of it no. and fell to my death. And yeah, that two hour, like two hours of Skyrim gone, and I just uninstalled the game and have never played it since. <laughs> but that is that is kind of the level of yeah, yeah that that's a, that's an approximation of the uh, the frustration. I've got that. Uh, I've got a question for you guys um, because this is something that like I've thought a lot about. So you guys, I know you guys talk about beating beating the old computer. Uh, you're playing against that's PVE, generally PVE. 
What do you think is harder? That sort of like permadeath in WoW, permadeath Skyrim, uh, like Doom Eternal on Ultra Nightmare, or getting to, we're talking like top 1,000 Overwatch, or, uh, you know, the second highest to the highest rank in Apex. Like, what is? what do you think is hard? I really truly don't know. Definitely PvP. Definitely. Is it PvP? Okay. I, yeah, I, I, I agree. 100%. The only reason I say that is because I know we're not quite there yet, but we're designing like AI and computers that can play against humans and beat them. So it's like, are we there yet in video games? I don't, I feel like we're not, but I don't know. We could I, be. I, I think the, the big difference is that when it's, when you're a game designer, you're designing a system that is learning, but it's all logic based. And as a player, if you dedicate enough time, you can kind of un, unwind that logic and then right. kind of know the cause and effect of things. Right, right. And once you know that, then you can pretty much master it. Um, versus fighting against other players with a constantly shifting kind of skill set and strategy and everything, mm -hmm. it's it's never really masterable because you know whoever you're up against will be playing differently. I so I tend to agree. Um, that's usually the way I think about it. But I just wasn't sure. I I wonder because I mean you guys, I think most of the time you guys are playing PVE and not PVP stuff. Yeah, I definitely prefer PvE. And I, I prefer PvE as well because there is, like, it, th there's a sense of accomplishment that you get from beating a stage or beating a game or whatever, and you know you'll probably do it in, a like, a specified amount of time, barring the, the stuff that Lawrence did, like, with, with Doom on Ultra Nightmare. Um, but, like, with PvP, I mean, I slammed my head against that wall for years on Overwatch, and I felt like I wasn't getting better at all. It was, like, one of those things where you just... At some point, you just like reached a skill cap, and you're like, "That's it. I guess this is what I am." <laughs> and it felt terrible. <laughs> and mm -hmm. It doesn't feel good at all. So I, I, like I said, I tend to agree with you. I just, I was just wondering what you guys thought. I, <clears throat> I think the big philosophical difference is that everyone makes PVE content to be beaten. Yeah. But yeah. no one plays a PVP game to lose. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's that's kind of the idea. Game developers will tune a PVE challenge to be challenging and demand something of the player, but ultimately, if they meet certain skill checks, will allow them to win. Um, no human is like that. No human goes into a game and they're like, I just wanted to see if you knew how to do this properly, and you did, <laughs> and now you will win. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's the big difference, is that no matter what, other players are always going to try to win all the time in any way they can. Yep. And if you, you can make AI play that way, but no one likes that because it, it sucks. <laughs> uh, because AI can always beat you. It's just the, uh, it's just yeah. um, developers tuning it to provide the illusion of accomplishment. I mean, what you're also asking, Bruce, is like, is there a PvE game out there that is harder than the hardest PvP experience? And it's like... I mean, yeah, I'm sure someone could design there, an aimbot cheating. Is there, though? Like, you know. I'd say I mean, so. Yeah, like, imagine you're playing, you know, I don't know, PUBG or whatever, and it's like they put, a, you know, 50 robots on a tower with perfect sight that can shoot the entire map, and then you're like, okay, I spawn in and I die every single time. Yeah, but this is, and you're this, like, is a, okay. this is a really good competition, though, to throw the best esports athletes in the world into like you throw the best person in PUBG ever, throw them in and see what they do. But the AI will always have more cheating capabilities because of how they're designed by the creator. You know, if the creator wants to make an unbeatable enemy, they just turn off taking damage on the enemy. Like I, I guess I. Oh, well, know, I, I mean, yeah, of course, yes. Barring God mode, yes. But what I'm saying is like the rules of the game, basically, is what I'm saying. So, because it's, so, it's like chess. Because think of chess, right? They, they they created an AI that to play chess, and and that I think that AI has basically right. beaten every human. Right? Is that is that correct? Well, it's it's then it becomes you. I mean, oh yeah, I think what you're asking. I I believe that's true. I'm not sure if it if there is an exception to that, but because um, I feel like we've got so much media that either <laughs> like so many fiction, you know, have the AI winning or the human winning. That I at this point I have no. I'm idea not which sure. One yeah, actually, no, I'm not sure. Um, but that then totally depends on the game because within the confines of the game, you know, technically you can make a 300 meter shot or something like that with a sniper in a survival game. But humans can pretty much never do that. 
an AI can certainly do that if they're to take their limiters off, you know, sort of thing. If the if the creators of the game designed an AI to use its full the game's potential to kill someone else in that game, they would win. I don't think there is any competition about that. Well, that's but that's just gaming the system. I guess this is what I mean is that like there has there, there's a game like chess. Chess is a good example because chess is a, is a game that has specified rules. That like of course yes, if you let the computer change the rules, the computer's going to win. But you get into a game that doesn't change the rules, and then you find out because like somebody in my chat, and I've seen this before by the way. Somebody in my chat was saying, "Oh yeah, uh, Shroud has killed numerous hackers. He has. Um, that's a thing that he's done." And hackers still have human fault, though. I don't think that that really counts. I think it's more what we're what we're talking about is a AI. In a, in a game system that is better than the best player of that game. Well, but you're letting them change the rules. Oh, you're, you're letting them change the rules. But the AI, by default, plays by different rules than a player would. I mean, n n no, what? no, yeah, not, not, in not, not in chess, that's what I'm saying. Is it like... Well, yeah, but chess is, I think, totally different than a video game, because chess has two players that have the exact same inputs. I think many video games aren't that that pure of a system there's so many oh yeah you can make it that way though you could you could totally make it that way you can make the you have other examples i guess besides chess though i mean well so so trey is posting about the deep mind experiment that google ran with starcraft 2 um where yeah they they used ai to have an to play the game like they're, they're they weren't allowed to like go under the interface layer the ai still had to do inputs and place buildings and stuff like that and uh, kind of speaking to the difference between chess and video games um one of the things I find fascinating about certain competitive games is the difference between like the the mechanics of hitting buttons uh, and then the meta strategy of it. So, and and I, I promise this is going somewhere, but because <laughs> it takes a little bit of explanation, something like like Dota or something like League of Legends, you can hit enough buttons to be as good as you possibly can. The question is like when do you hit those buttons and and why, and then it's about strategy that informs when you're hitting the buttons. There are other games like StarCraft II or Tetris where no matter how fast you are, you could still be faster. And the faster you are, the better you can play. So in something like StarCraft II, people have hit limits of like 450 actions per minute. And that's about as fast as humans can ever play, at least as far as we know with the brains we have. But if you could do 500 or 600, you would be a better player, provided those actions are meaningful. Same with Tetris. Tetris can go so fast, the human brain just can't play it anymore. And people have about hit that boundary. Um, so the, th the thing about the AI is, is that it can do inputs faster than a human brain can. Um, so for certain games, when it can just do actions faster, it has that advantage. Then the advantage for the human side has to be, well, you can outthink it, or you can predict what it's going to do, or do something unexpected and beat it for that. But then AI also has like big data, so it can source really powerful strategies and things like that. So I do think it is at the point now where AI can both play fast enough and have strategies that humans can't beat. And that seems to be borne out by the deep mind experiment that Trey was posting about StarCraft II. And I think StarCraft II is the optimal choice because it has both those aspects. It has the strategy and then also the input complexity. Yeah. That means that uh, it I, I can't cap out. Input complexity is a really good part of this argument. The other is like linear and nonlinear. Like certain games that are hmm. linear, there's like a progression of moves that there's only a finite amount that can happen within the game. But in like an open world game where you could go left, you can go right, you can jump, you can crouch. Like there's just so many different variables that I think it's a lot harder to set parameters for that sort of competition. Well, that, that's kind of why I brought it up because I'm, I, I would love to see it. Like I'd love to see someone make it because uh, oh, like, yeah, j j I, I would love to see, you know, like, let's say we put, you know, what are phase clan. <laughs> Up against uh, whoever else um, in fucking uh, on Apex, and then just see what just get ten robots robots out on Apex. Have them designed to again follow the rules of Apex, but uh, but they can like you said they can aimbot, they can do all that other shit. I'm just I'm just I'm just curious to see what happens. Yeah, it's tricky to imagine a world where that. I mean, the developer would have to make that. There would have to be a demand for that. I don't think there's any demand for that. I know. I don't think anyone well, wants a, a, an AI like that. It would be that a, do that. it would be a cool uh, event that somebody would make. Mm -hmm. That somebody would design. basically like a. I mean, it's 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 like um, what is it? Battle bots, <laughs> but um, 
remember, I don't know if you, remember, you guys remember Battle Bro, Bot, but Well, you're just describing Salty Bet now. Yeah. Of watching AI fight each other? Well, yeah. it's without AI, though. I, I want to see the best humans versus oh, the best sorry. AI. Um, oh, well, that, that's that's Deep Mind. That that happened in StarCraft 2 and the AI won. The AI, yeah, the AI pretty, got to... was Pretty resounding. Yeah. Um, and I, I just want to see, because, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's what they were doing with chess, and, like, eventually the AI was beating humans in chess, and everyone's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, what are... What are we gonna do? So like, I don't know. It's just it's fun to see uh, the levels of competition get get one upped over and over and over. Yeah, because I don't. There's there's not gonna be any human out there that's gonna be like, you know what? AI wins every time. Like there's there's gonna be somebody who thinks they can beat it. So this just reminds me of that. Uh, I don't know why, but it reminds me of um, there was this old arcade game, and all it had was this robotic hand coming out. And you had to go up and arm wrestle this fucking robo hand. And then the screen was just the face of the person you were wrestling. I don't know. Oh, wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that because it was sick. Because if you started arm wrestling it without putting in money, it would try to return back to center. And then you could kind of practice on that because I never had any money when I was a kid. <laughs> that arcade game was cool. Anyway, felt good to beat the, felt good to beat the machine. Yeah, it feels, it feels good to beat the machine. That, that's kind of what I'm, I, was, I was saying is that like I don't know if... Because we're saying, okay, well, humans versus humans is harder than a human versus AI. But I guess, I guess the more that we've settled on this, the more we're like, well, it depends on how the AI is designed. Because if yeah, I think yeah. I think AI has the capacity to be the hardest possible thing. Yeah, it's just when you're playing a PVE game, it's obviously tuned to the, to allow you to win at some point, right. provided you hit mm -hmm. a skill check. Um, yeah, I that's what that's what I'm kind of bummed about, and. It's weird to me, like, it, some people have, have brought it up, but nobody seems to mind much that in multiplayer games now, there's a lot of AI just getting slipped in there. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's there's no indication of somebody is a human or an AI. Um, and to some degree, this, this was always a thing. I remember going to, like, Unreal servers back in the 2000s that would have AI in them just so they wouldn't be empty. And then I would go, and, like, they would even, like, put stuff in text chat when they killed people, like, no shot, and be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, it takes a creepy. while. Yeah. yeah, it takes a while. But back in the day, at least, you could eventually just figure out through mannerisms and certainly through text chat that these people weren't human. It was just weird that that was never disclosed to you. Um, and now, when you have stuff like battle royales, where the, your first couple of rounds are going to be against AI that give you an easy win to make you feel good, um, it makes me wonder: uh, at what point does that kind of violate some kind of implicit trust that you have that when you play a game? The challenge isn't conforming itself around just keeping you playing. I, I guess there's no harm if you're having fun, but uh, it feels weird. Like like Bruce, for example, let's say you're playing Overwatch, and you just you just gone through three losses in a row, and all of their metrics say that when people get four losses, they stop playing. So when you hit Q again and you're all you're all heated, then they give you a match where you're against an AI team that gives you like a reasonable but pretty guaranteed win. Would you feel like it's cheap if you didn't, you didn't know? Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I totally would. I mean, like, I, uh, this is a good, this is a really good thing that you brought up because I was just playing, I'm doing a COD Mobile sponsored video here in a few days, and COD Mobile is exactly that. Like, you get on and it, it's a mobile game, like, you're playing against the computer, but it's in Call of Duty. So it's like, you, you think Call of Duty is versus other people when you join a multiplayer match in the app, but you know, <laughs> you can see the other players running around like robots. So you're like, you're getting a bunch of kills and you're like, oh yeah, okay, all right, well, I'm killing robots. But that's only because I have an understanding of what's happening and what the game is. And I guess, I guess most people probably do, but if, do they think they're trying to fool you? Like, I, I don't know. For me, I, I wasn't fooled immediately. And in reality, I was like, oh yeah, well, I'm playing against robots. It feels good to play against robots because I get, to, I get a bunch of kills, but, but I know it. Now, like, like Lawrence said, it's like, imagine if I went through the Battle Royale match, won the Battle Royale match, and I was like, man, that's so fucking hard. And then afterward, Lawrence was like, oh, yeah, those are all robots. And I was like, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, that would have that would have absolutely taken away from, yeah. from my accomplishment. That's, that's an interesting thought. I mean, a, another example of this would be the new Predator game that, I guess, just came out, or is coming out. It's, a, it's um, out, yeah. It, yeah, it just came out. Uh, where there's, like, AI soldiers... Oh, by the way, Bruce, did you voice one of those? I, 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 I voiced I all. I, I voiced it. all of them. <laughs> all of them. Every AI that you kill in that game that's a human is me. 
Whoa. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's like I, I knew it. I read a bunch of lines and they're basically all just me. So I I killed Bruce so many times when I was playing. You did. I felt you totally did. very odd about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, those there's like a ton of AI soldiers that look pretty similar to your characters, uh, but they're functionally different because they're kind of neutral or enemies to a bunch of different stuff. Um, versus the Predator, who's obviously looks different to anyone. But as the Predator, there were a few times when I first started playing it where uh, I accidentally like would sneak up and ambush the AI soldiers thinking they were yeah. the players. And then I would out myself for the players to come and shoot me. Right, so, right. you know, that's, I think, an example of they, trying to make a like a, a, a system or a game where there's like a third party that is AI between the two player, you know, parties, um, and then trying to find a way for them to balance. And I think that's really interesting. It allows for like a lot of really creative design scenarios and uh, what's it called? Um, uh, Non-parallel kind of gameplay loops. Um, but it's also, there's a risk because if you can't make it very clear to differentiate them, then you end up getting a false sense of achievement. Well, that's what... <laughs> that's Tarkov as well? I think, yeah, yeah Tar it's Tarkov. Tarkov. I was just about to say, it's 100% Tarkov. But but Tarkov, just like in Predator, you look at the players, you look at a guy on the screen as you're running by, and you see what he's doing, and you're like, oh, that's a robot. Because you see him like running back and forth and not, yep. not moving like a human, basically. Um, and I'm sure that the designers do that on purpose. They're like, oh, well, well, we'll only give it a specific level of AI because other players will know, okay, this is AI. Um, it's just basically you're just throw, they're just throwing more enemies at you. Um, mm -hmm. But they know you're not going to accidentally get fooled into thinking they're real. Um, I think like what Lawrence is talking about, if we get to a point where we don't know, where we can't differentiate between AI and human, then it starts to get really super weird. And I, don't, I can't think of a video game that exists like that right now. Hmm. hmm. I mean, the thing is, we we won't know if, if, if the system's working as intended. That's true. We'll never find out. I just I think it's strange that no one no one seems to mind for for all the things that that the gamers uh, get really upset about <laughs> in defense of their pastime. It's interesting that this this issue sort of came and went, and no one really cared. Um, it seems strange to me that like there's not some kind of insistence that in games. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that in games that um, that like AI or human players are, are explicitly separated. Um, somebody said Titanfall did it really well. Yeah, I agree. Um, it just it just concerns me that to some degree I feel like AI is going to be used as a retention mechanism and it's gonna it's gonna work. Um, and that feels a, that just feels weird to me. It feels very weird. Yeah. Um, and and it's funny you bring up Call of Duty Mobile because that's I I'm doing the sponsor thing too and had exactly the same experience. Um, and yeah, when I was getting easy wins, I was like, you know, okay, I, <laughs> these people are just walking out and letting me shoot them. So I can, I can reasonably be assured that these are bots. If you keep playing, they will eventually start pr sprinkling in some humans. Um, and it's crazy because the score screen really tells the tale. I've had a few matches where it's like, there's one human on my team and one human on their team. And it'll be like, you know, it's first to 50 kills or whatever. I'll have 20. The other guy has 19. And everyone yeah. else has like two. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty obvious there too. Also, when somebody just has their phone mic open, which is, I actually dearly love because it's deeply nostalgic to hear somebody getting screamed at by their mom while you're playing Call of Duty. <laughs> but I feel like, yeah, there's going to be a time where, uh, kind of like I theorized before, they're just going to, they're going to feed you not obvious AI just to keep you playing. Um, and they're gonna they're gonna carry you through a match to make you feel like it's valuable, but then maybe fold at the end, or or give you a valuable play. Um, <laughs> look, crap, dude got a water balloon right in the mouth. That's amazing. Uh, uh, Nivek, uh, sorry, you're asking what games we're talking about specifically. Nothing yet, but yeah, there were yeah the Activision patents around seeding AI with human behaviors. Even stuff like AI forming clans and inviting you to those clans, making profiles for these AIs so they look like people, and all of this stuff can be tailored around the file they have on you, on your anonymized user ID. So it's like, you know, if you love anime or whatever, then you'll get an invite to a bot-only clan, and all of them have anime avatars, and, <laughs> and like, just to make you feel like you're, you're, you know, you found a place oh, so of people. But oh man. 
you're imagining that they're gonna make like fake communities that pretend to be real yeah, yeah. that welcome you in mm-hmm. so you don't feel well, alone. Disco Joe, just to keep you engaged in buying stuff. Dis- yeah. Disco Joe just asked, what if they're putting in shitty AI to make you think the good AI is a real player? <laughs> Which they could be. They totally yeah, yeah, they totally I, could be. I totally believe that. I mean, I think a great example of this actually is the Amiibo system. They added that so many years ago, right? It was like it was the 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 previous Smash Bros where you could buy that little amiibo character and then uh, they would learn based on your moves and some of them became strong enough that they were actually beating other players and you couldn't do anything about it. Um, I mean, eventually you could probably, you know, beat them and learn how they, they're programmed, but uh, I, I love that they have different levels of AI that learn as they go and they don't even, like, hide that. They just make that part of the feature. Yeah. They're like, yeah, it's, you know, train your little robot buddy. And that's why I that's why I keep wanting us, you know what? Let's do it. Let's start a GoFundMe where we get twenty people from FaZe Clan versus twenty AI design like basically AI designed to win a video game. Like the, the most the developers can get to, the highest AI they can make for a first person shooter or whatever else. And then put them against each other. I would love to see it. I think it'd be so cool. It'd be so cool. I, I think the FaZe boys would be rinsed no matter what. I, but, I probably, uh, probably, but I'd love to see it though. See what happens, you know. Yeah. It'd be fun to watch. Now now, Bruce, let me let me uh let me galaxy brain you a little bit. Yeah. Let's say we do this. Smash success, we get our twenty grand or whatever. <laughs> um and but it starts a narrative, right? People want to see those phase boys come back and beat the machine. So they go training, and then you, Bruce, being a smart producer or event organizer, you go and you dumb down the AI a little bit. You don't have to tell anybody. Mm. And then round two, Rocky two, uh, fight for the championship again. And this time, FaZe wins. It's a hard fight, but they win. And boy, what an event. What a comeback. Um, exactly. I feel, like, I feel like to some degree, you can almost create narratives around all this stuff. And it's all, it's all in service of like creating entertainment, right? To, to drag money out of people's wallets. So I feel like the, the purity of this endeavor is is lost somewhere along the line because people just want to want to make money and it doesn't matter how like how pure it is. That's what kind of it's kind of bugs me about Google Stadia is that when it's all generated in the cloud and it's not just like on my hard drive running on my metal, I have no idea what's happening under the hood anymore. Um, and I feel like to some degree the the directness of the gaming experience gets fuzzed out when if every game's running on the cloud, then it can just tune itself around my whims at a moment and it, and then it all just becomes like masturbatory but Lawrence, i actually does it matter though if it's fun for me fun is knowing that there's a bar that didn't move that i was able to clear yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. that's fair but the thing is like then ai is going to know that too so they're going to have a bar <laughs> that they're going to hold above me for a little bit and then they're going to bump it down and then i'll be able to clear it and i'll be like yay so i don't know yeah you, you, I guess to some degree, this this if you want to really roll it all back, it just goes to allegory of the cave shit, where none of us can see pure truth. And uh, yeah, actually, there it is. Yep, there it is. If you enjoy the if you time, enjoy the time you wasted. Yeah, so then, then it's not wasted time. I mean, that's that's true. Um, and that's the thing is that like when I was playing COD, I was like, I'm still having fun. Like it's I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. So uh, and and obviously it'll wear off just like everything else. But uh, but I was still enjoying it and and i just i think just the fact that it was in just it was the fact that it was like the cod engine and the the cod setup to me made it feel like i was you know killing other players because i played cod for so many years um mm-hmm. and it, that's a, that's a, it was a weird feeling because i i had to sort of snap back and be like well hold on i'm actually just killing robots this is just a mobile game at this point i'm just doing match threes but with first person shooters you know so i don't know it's fun. Fun to think about. Yeah, I agree. I it's funny too because I have I've in the past ranted against the 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 ego of like I don't even know. Like I was just <laughs> knocking over everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, people that that feel an intense amount of ego or accomplishment for beating a game that was designed to be beaten, you know? Like you're not a real gamer unless you beat Dark Souls. It's like, well, I mean, come on. They they made Dark Souls 2 be beaten, so you didn't like you didn't climb a mountain. The mountain was there. The mountain is there, and it doesn't change itself to be climbed. Right. It just existed. So the people who climb it kind of 
they they rose to a bar. Uh, whereas, like, if they installed stairs on Mount Everest, climbing it would mean something else. Um, so I, I feel like m kind of exposing myself a little bit and that I do like to feel some amount of accomplishment that I guess, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe I need to maybe I need to change my headspace around why I play video games or the illusion that I'm, I'm improving or gathering skill in some way. That's the thing is I don't I don't know. Then that's kind of like with with multiplayer games. The reason I would play a multiplayer game is because then I could feel if I knew that I was getting better at it and I was winning more or whatever else. Um, that I, I felt like I was getting better at something, but with PVE, I don't know. Like you said, Lawrence, they're designed to be beaten, so it's like if I played Dark Souls, and I, alright, eventually it's like mastered the, the mechanics of Dark Souls and played it, and beat it. Th is that it? Like, is I'm like, okay, well, I guess I, I, I did it, then I mastered those mechanics, and then do those mechanics carry over to something else? Hopefully they do. Uh, other Dark Souls? Another Souls Yeah, game. other Dark Souls games, other Soulsborne uh -huh. games, but, but for the most part, was it, you know, was it because of the challenge, or was it because it was fun? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Kraken, do you feel like you're missing out on anything by not getting all those golden bananas and... All the what? <laughs> you, you cut out. Do you feel like... Oh, I did? Yeah, oh, yeah weird. at the very end. Uh, do you feel like you're missing out, or that you... You have unfinished business by not getting all those golden bananas in, in uh, Donkey oh. Kong 64? Or do you feel like you can just move on and it doesn't, it doesn't matter? I mean, I have moved on <laughs> to some degree. Well, I, I haven't been pining for that those last couple of golden bananas, but I'm sure there is some deep part of me that is like, you know, felt there's unresolved business with that. But I, I'm not like a completionist in games. I don't I don't feel the need to get everything in general. So I, I, maybe that's just like put on. I, I don't I wouldn't say there's any any part of me that feels like I didn't finish the game. I didn't play the game. Because I got everything out of the game that I needed to. Yeah. This is that, you know, I didn't officially beat it. Yeah. I, it's it's weird with, like, uh, Bannerlord's a great example. Like, when I talked to you, I asked Kraken, I was like, how did you know you were done? And basically you're like, oh, well, I got to a point where with, with this, like, I'm just going to sit there and duke it out with the CPU for hours and hours and hours, and eventually, yes, I'll take over everything. I had a, I had a large enough army to do it. But for me, when I'm playing Bannerlord, I see that that road coming, but I'm, but I want, I want to, I'm going to zoom out and see the entire map of just me, right? I want to, mm. and I, very rarely do I feel that way with video games. I'm usually not a completionist, but with this, for some reason, with this one, it's done a good job of making me feel like I'm still having to fight those wars and those battles, even though I think it's probably a foregone conclusion that I'm going to beat it. Uh, that's interesting. Y yeah, I, I, I think that's just like the different types of of people, and you, you mean, like you said. Most games you probably don't feel that way. Nah. Some games are really good at making you feel that way, and I think they're often the antagonistic games. And I think Bannerlord actually hmm. fits that really well because so much of what the AI does in Bannerlord is like just disrespects you. Yeah, like, yes. You know, <laughs> it'll just do things that they don't seemingly have a reason, but it just screws you over or mildly inconveniences you, or you have to go out of your way to put them down. You end up killing entire family lines <laughs> yeah. because they won't just acknowledge that you're better than them and give up. That's right. And so you're like, all right, guess I'm not stopping till everyone else is dead. <laughs> and the game, at least in its current state, which I think hopefully they will fix by the time it launches, it need, it requires you to do that. It, it there does. There is no world where it it you can absorb another faction or like they just say, all right, we surrender. It They require you to murder every single noble <laughs> otherwise they will just defect to another faction and fight you from there and it's insane that that's what it requires so once i realized that i'm like all right this game's not done i'm not gonna i'm not gonna give it the satisfaction of an extended battle <laughs> with all of its you know flaws i i have found what i consider my victory and i'm gonna take it yeah I, I do respect that you are not taking that as an answer, and you're also saying, I will beat it by its own rules, and I will remove everyone else from the game but myself. Most of the time, I, that's the way I play video games like you, Craig, and with The End of Bannerlord, where like, I'll play 20 hours of it or whatever and be like, yeah, got it. All right. I know that I could easily beat this game now at this point. I've, I've mastered the mechanics. We're good, and just move on, um, unless the story compels me or whatever. But with Bannerlord, for some reason, like you just said, it's antagonistic. It, it makes you angry. It keeps frustrating you, 
and you're like, well, what the fuck, dude? Like, basically, every time somebody attacks me, I'm like, what the fuck, bro? I've got 700 people. Why are you doing this to me? And then, so then, I, then I'm like, all right, well, I gotta go kill your sons and daughters and your families to like teach you a lesson. So there's something, there's something about that video game specifically that's gotten me, and I can't think of another video game that's done that to me, which is, which is, it's kind of cool in a, in a specific way. I don't know. Yeah, I um. One thing I, I've wanted to like experiment with 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 live streams in, specific, in particular is like finding uh, emergent goals to complete a character arc, either during a stream or once they've happened, and then using that as a pivot point to either make a new character or to like do a new stream or to you know pivot and do something else. Um, because I think it's easy to fall into that pitfall of. I have to do this in order to complete my story. And then along the way is a lot of tedium before that final resolution. Um, but it'd be really cool if it was like, okay, my Bandler character is only interested in holding this one city. Mm -hmm. And here are all the reasons why holding this one city will be challenging for us to take. And then that entire journey has a very clear light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's kind of what I've been, I wanna, that's what I've been experimenting with with the Oblivion streams that I've been doing as well as like Skyrim and I mean, Bethesda games are great for this, but like you, instead of saying I need to beat the main story or I need to do this, it's like I need to have all of the cheese in the land and fill my house with cheese so I can't walk in anymore because there's too much cheese. <laughs> and like, you know, that journey would be interesting for that character because that's like the whole conceit of that arc. Right. So I don't know. I, I want to come up with a better system for how to make that work and apply it to other games because I think it would be a lot better that, that's yeah that, that for me is the narrative that I'm just gonna take over everything and that mm -hmm. basically I'm going to kill off every single person in the land and yeah. and make sure that they are now part of my faction that's that's my goal I, correct me if I'm wrong Lawrence but that's kind of the way you look at doom and doom eternal I'm I'm much more literal about it uh, if the game has the audacity to pose a challenge I will try to rise to beat it but mm. Yeah, I, I have never just naturally defaulted into the mindset of I'm going to approach this game and set the set the goals for myself. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why. Maybe it's just a lack of imagination on my part. Uh, but I, 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 I think you would appreciate it. I, I would I would challenge you just as I'm challenging Bruce to beat Super Monkey Ball. Actually, no, it's also a challenge for Lawrence. Yeah, it's no, it's me I'm too. double challenging Lawrence. <laughs> um, I, I think you'd have a lot of fun uh, coming up with like a self-defined challenge because uh, like Bruce and and I did this in uh, in WoW with uh, the Amish challenge we did. You know, oh, I didn't. Over last I didn't summer. do it with you guys. I wanted to, but I didn't get to. Oh, you didn't. No, I thought you were part of the no, second. I, I wasn't able. I was never able to. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Well, then what we will do in the future with our WoW Amish challenge is. Uh, oh God. Yeah. Man, Sorry, this video is incredible. This video is great. Um, uh, we did a challenge where we set restrictions in how we played World of Warcraft, namely. If you die, your character is dead. Delete them instantly. Like, you have one life. Number two, you can only use gear that is crafted within the family. And the family is everyone else on the challenge. <laughs> you can't accept trades or money from anyone that isn't also doing the challenge. So, with that, those rules in mind, it was a completely different game. Uh, and it was super exhilarating. And you were kind of held to this artificial challenge standard by everyone else. Uh, that was playing because if you fucked up and you started using gear that you didn't earn, you didn't make yourself, then you were excommunicated from everyone else. Uh, and like, you know, the societal pressure became its own rule set. Uh, and so we've done a couple of seasons of it and it was a lot of fun. Um, but I would, I mean, you could apply that sort of, you know, rule set to a lot of different games. Like in Skyrim, I only make stuff that I craft and I have one life and like see how long you can make it sort of thing. Yeah. You know? I guess, I guess what occurs to me is like, to be able to come up with challenges within a game, it requires a pretty steady or requires a pretty thorough knowledge of what's possible in that game first, right? So I feel like I never get to that point where I invest that amount of time in a single game to know what's possible and then construct a derivative challenge from it. Um, so to extend it to something like Doom, it would be like, okay, beat the game without dying. Okay, now do it with just the pistol or do it with just the shotgun um, or do it without picking up any health. like. Those those are very literal examples and don't have much of a fun narrative behind them. But for something like Bannerlord, I feel like there's that weird gap where 
to create a narrative and play a character a certain way, you kind of need to know that that's even possible first. Mm -hmm. So well, then you don't have to start off like that. I think you, you do, hmm. do a playthrough, you know, vanilla or default or with a couple mods to like quality of life. And then while playing it, you get a ton of ideas of like, oh, this part of the game I really like, this part I don't like. What if we made our new character and focused exclusively on the part that I liked? Yeah, that's the process. Uh, and I feel like, and I think that's where my, my, my reasoning breaks down. It's hard for me to invest time in a game if I don't already have a goal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I remember, actually, it's, it's crazy to bring that up because I remember doing that exact thing with Skyrim. I, I started the game and I was like, I'm going to play this kind of character. I went through the character creation and I had my like character in mind as I was playing. But then none of the dialogue options allowed me to express any of that. None of the quests allowed me to express any of that. It just wasn't possible in the game to do what I was hoping to come to the game to do with in my headspace. And that kind of just like, I was like, well, why am I playing then? Um, I should have, at that point, I guess I could have pivoted or looked for mods or something like that. But Or you like it just, hard, uh, hardcore RP it, basically, at that point. And then when something doesn't go your way in the game, you just, you just kind of, you go around it with improv and be like, whoop, can't do that. And then you sort of just keep moving. Yeah, I guess that's that's the idea. It's I guess it's tough for me to overcome that hump of like something like Bannerlord, where I get into it and they they do give you objectives in the game, but without like an end goal, I guess it's hard for me to know why I should play. But I guess research is good enough. Just and it sounds stupid to say, but actually just playing, like just having mm -hmm. fun, yeah. <laughs> having fun and messing with toys, like that should be what it is. Uh, have you played much like? either real-time or turn-based uh, strategy games like, you know, Total War or Civilization, Lawrence? Uh, I have in the past, um, mostly when I had an abundance of free time. And then I would just, yeah, I would just start a campaign and just see what happens. I remember like Civ 2, Civ 3. I would just, you know, start campaigns and play them through and just try to win. But I, I never really got to the mind space in that game where I would like... I don't know, it was weird. With something like Civ, I'd start a I'd start a campaign and I'd have a strategy. I mean, like, I'm going to go for a cultural victory mm -hmm. or something like that. Very basic. And then just circumstances would happen to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't get the tiles that I needed to get the research points to pursue my strat. And, the, like, I had to pivot at some point. And then it's like, okay, well, I guess I'm just trying to win now, which makes it, you know, like any other game, I guess. So I, I think yeah, it's, it's I think the pivoting is kind of what people find fun about those sort of, those sort of games and like when a wrench is thrown in your plan when someone declares war on you ten turns before you expected them to and then you've got to like figure out a new way of, of pulling it off I think that's uh, that's that's what really makes those games interesting to me and Baylor is much the same way it's like you know you 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 uh, I mean most of them are like either declare war is declared on you or you encounter a much stronger enemy than you're expecting or you know something like that but um yeah i i i personally love those games i think more than i like you know a first person shooter or something like that that's all based on personal or team skill because it requires a lot more like dynamic either storytelling or action reaction um but it's just cool to hear that we all approach games differently, I guess, and yeah. our own independent goals with them. The, well, I think I'm, like, for streaming, I, I, PvE games work really well because, like Kraken was saying, it's like you can establish a goal for your stream or you can establish a goal for your character and then be like, okay, I can probably do this at the end of 16 hours or whatever. Um, whereas I never approached games like first-person shooters. when I, I mainly play first-person shooters, and to me, the better... Or I could carry over those skills to other video games, to other multiplayer first-person shooter games. And I always knew they'd be around. So for me, it felt like I was getting better at um, a skill, not necessarily just one game. Um, but now seeing doing that with PvE games, you 100% can get yourself into that magic mindset that developers uh, put you in when you have to play a video against PvE. You can then apply that logic to a bunch of other different video games in that genre and that's kind of the way I've, mm -hmm. I've sort of learned over the course of like three four years or so and it's it helped me sort of change my mindset a little hmm yeah i think i think truly what it is is needing to abandon the uh the idea that completing a game or accomplishing an arbitrary task set by developers before you it has like cumulative value it's like mm -hmm. I, I have no problem like walking away from a tv series the second I feel 
like it's not going a place I want it to. So I don't understand why I don't apply that to, to games or, or change the way that I interact with them to uh, hmm. derive more more fun from them. Uh, I guess I'm just super literal about that in particular, and I wonder where that... I'll have to, I'll have to do some mind palace diving to figure out where that's coming from. <laughs> what, what was your gamer score on, uh, on your old Xbox or PlayStation or whatever? Oh, jeez. I'm sure you remember, because obviously you put some value into uh, those, the Chivos. I used to. Um, and, and really, the only reason I cared about those back then is, is during like Generation 7 of consoles, games got really, really, really easy. So the only way to make them interesting for me was to try to play in and try to efficientize, not a word, but pretend it is, try to try to make that process, try to like, uh, I guess, min-max the acquisition of achievements because that would make it a little spicy. So if like, if I go through the achievement list and it's like beat level four using only the knife, I'm like, okay, that actually makes this game interesting as opposed to a hallway filled with explosions yeah, that I just yeah. run through. Um, I went to xbox.com and it's not the biggest number right on the front page, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence's actually Lawrence's gamer score was very very high, and it's, it, this is speaking to my mindset while Lawrence looks for it. My mindset with gamer score was exactly the opposite. I remember going like, "What are these points for?" And I, and people would be like, "Oh, well, you can't really do anything with them. Like, it's basically just a score that you show to other people." And I was like, "That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard." Yeah, I was in that same boat. It never it never made any sense to me. I, I was like, "Why would I raise this number?" Like at that point, I knew it was just. A, uh, a, a money grab. I was like, oh, well, they just want me to play their video games to raise this score. And the score doesn't, but like Lawrence has corrected me a number of times now, you can you can trade those points in for prizes. <laughs> so uh, Can you? No. Um, kind of, sort of. There, there's, there's another rewards program that you can actually, you can actually get stuff from. Some achievements have like little unlockables. And if you have certain achievement score that you're like Xbox platinum or something or you get a i don't know what it is it's a it's a fairly meaningless it's a real it's a real stretch yeah (laughs) okay i found it 141,290. that's really good um it's really really good yeah like showing other people was never the the motivation for me though it was and i guess again going back to the mentality of feeling like completion game completion like it's like every game you beat goes into some vault and the higher the stack is when you die the better of life you've lived um that's what it was for me. It was just a way to chronicle uh, gaming accomplishments. Uh, like a single number that gets higher uh, is pretty intoxicating as a, as a dumb and meaningless payoff for the amount of time and effort you expend into a video game. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, that makes Yeah, that's pretty much it. It makes sense. It makes sense to me. Um, like I can, I see the mindset. I just wasn't ever mine. That's all. Um, it, it wasn't that I'd, I'd never didn't see the logic because that's a, you're right, Lawrence. It's a good way to like quantify how long you've spent doing that um so you gotta show people or you gotta let people know you come correct i uh it actually only ca- it came in useful it came in use once when somebody accused me of not playing a game nice. and then i was able to like show them the achievement that i got score. yeah <laughs> check it bruh got the chivos <laughs> shut him up real quick actually it didn't he was just like i don't give a shit yeah, no. I was like, okay, well. <laughs> that was fast yeah i think it was borderlands 2 like uh, we were doing some reporting on borderlands 3 and since that game came out, like, I don't know, eight years ago, there were some details that I forgot about Borderlands 2. And then somebody accused me of being a fake gamer or not liking Borderlands or something. And I was like, dude, I can prove it. I, pe- I spent tons of time in those games. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and it, yeah, that didn't matter, though. So <laughs> achievements, achievements did not save me that day. You know what? Maybe, Lawrence, one day they will. <laughs> one day achievements may save you and then Kraken and I will be executed. Because our gamer scores are so oh, low. Oh man, when Microsoft sure. takes over, yeah. <laughs> everyone below one hundred thousand gamer score is now deficient. <laughs> Banned from video games. Uh, We're all gonna have a QR code tattooed on our foreheads, and then we'll all have cyber eyes, such that when you look at somebody, their gamer score will be superimposed right on their forehead live. <laughs> that sounds like a Black that Mirror one. episode that I don't want to be any have any part of. Ray, so apparently, Ray has six hundred thousand gamer score. Oh no, it's way higher. I, no, he's over one million. Oh, he's over one million. People, I'm pretty sure. In, in my chat, I was like a in my chat. People are saying six hundred thousand. So no, I, no, it was a banner day when he hit a million. Was, uh, did he, there was a parade and everything. I don't know. I don't, oh no, yeah, he went over a million a while ago. So I don't know. Uh, looks like a lot of people are actually not. Uh, they they have no idea what Ray is doing on the stream. He's uh, he's over he's over a million. Has he? Is that tisk, been one tisk. of his things? Is he just seeks out? Yeah. Gamer, yeah, yeah. Gamer score. I mean, honestly, 
think of, think of it this way, Kraken. Achievement Hunter. That's what they did. They looked. Yeah, I, they that, for, I was going to bring that up. That is what the origin of that channel, right? Yeah, they looked for achievements, and then they were just trying to figure out yeah. how to get the gamer score higher. So well, I think it came from, I, I remember, because when we were about to start working at Rooster Teeth, I started listening to Drunk Tank and the RT podcast to just kind of absorb the culture. And there was there was one podcast where they were like, they, they started a challenge to see who could get the most achievement points in a given week yeah, or something that's like right, that. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think that's that's where it came from. Yeah, that's... Uh, um, it's 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 crazy. Those are it's perfect for like friend groups to do that kind of stuff, especially for content. So, mm-hmm. but. And I guess if you want to talk about like creating a narrative around the way you play, that's kind of a that's a form of doing it, right? It is uh, something it's other than just for playing people the game like record. you that need <laughs> some of. sort of uh, artificial, literal achievement instead of some sort of personal achievement. I think Kraken Kr- Kr- yep. saying he's better than you are, but this is coming from the guy who did not beat Donkey Kong whatever and I don't care. <laughs> did you beat Donkey Kong whatever, Mr. No, uh, you, Bruce Almighty? You know what? I didn't need that to value myself, Kraken. I didn't need to know that. I didn't care. It didn't matter what video game I beat. What do you think of that? Me either. Oh, yeah? So why put on that on me? <laughs> um, all right. We've reached an hour and a half. We did it. We made it to the end of the podcast. We're here. Congratulations. We did it. Um... What are you guys doing after the podcast? I play Oblivion that I have modded to absolute hell. Nice. Lawrence, what about you? I'm going back to Jedi Power Battles. A, oh, uh, yeah, that game's actually pretty good. It is, it is actually pretty good. Um, it's, it's a little jank. It's a little, well, it's a lot of unfair um, because, man, it's, it's rough and you only have so many lives and they, they burn away real quick. <laughs> Um, I also I got to the end of level three of ten last time, and then the game froze, oh. so I get to play level three again. Levels are also really long, yeah. So hopefully, if I just wipe off the disc, it'll be okay. We'll see. Yeah, good old Plo Kloon. Plo Kloon. Um, also, yeah. This is oh, it's only is it Plo Kloon? No, it's P L O K O O N. Plo Kloon. Oh, so the L's in the first name. Plo Kloon. Yeah, Plo Kloon. Okay. Um, this is also before Mace Window had his purple lightsaber, so it's you know it's not canonical, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, I'm excited to play it again. It's a, it is a very old school kind of game. You jump and you slash and you die. And yeah. That's it. Uh, well, thanks again for joining. I, uh, what are you doing, Bruce? Oh, I'm going to play Animal Crossing. I'm gonna, I'm making the Venice yeah. the Venice canals in my. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, in my on my island right now. So I have to slowly move. I don't cheat like Kraken, so I have to slowly move okay. every house. I'm leaving the call. Okay. Every- you know what? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thanks. Oh, there goes Kraken. All right. Um, <laughs> goodbye, YouTube. We will see you next week. Bye. Bye.